G'day everyone. I want to tell you about my 5-axis CNC router that I built. It's, um, it's one of my most proud accomplishments. I, I built it in 2015. It was meant to cut wood and plastic. It cost me 10,000 Australian dollars, 10, 10 months of full-time work. And uh, when I finished it, I never really used it for what I intended to use it for. Uh, and then I sold it to someone in Tasmania just before I moved up here in Brisbane. So today I'll be telling you its story, um, some technical details that are pretty interesting, and why I built it. So why did I build this machine? Well, I was freshly dropped out of my 3D video game art course. And uh, I thought that I would make a remote control car parts manufacturing company. I, I used to race them when I was younger. I've, I've even got one right here. And um, I thought th the first thing I'd make is body shells. So I thought that'd be pretty easy, right? It's only one part and I get to design it. So all I'd really need to do is model the car chassis design a body shell that's better than the one the car comes with, uh, also make a vacuum forming machine, and, oh, and a five axis CNC router. So, all right, easy, let's get to work, right? The first thing that I made was the vacuum forming machine that was built following Douglas Walsh's protoform plans. And those plans were really good and the machine came out great. So that was pretty good encouragement to move on to the CNC. I thought I could take on something bigger. I didn't actually need a five axis machine, uh, vacuum forming doesn't like having undercuts, you know, the body shell has to be able to release off of the, the mold. So uh, having a five axis machine to get into undercuts was basically pointless. But um, anyway, I wanted to make a five axis machine, so I made one. And I started designing and even building the machine before I really thought about what kind of electronics or what kind of software I would use to run it or even how to get some G-code for it. I, I just started building it. And uh, so I ended up building a 2.1 meter wide machine. Uh, it was 2.3 meters tall from the very, very top. And um, the, the Z travel was about 600 mil, but an upgrade to its rigidity reduced its travel. So later the Z travel was about 400 mil. The main chassis was made from a, a steel weldment of all 90 by 90, six millimeter thick uh, square hollow section. And some of that was filled with sand to reduce vibration. And uh, that was actually really good, that chassis. That, that was easily up to the task. It was really rigid. I couldn't pick it up by, by hand. I tried my hardest to pick up just one end and it was just too heavy and it was really rigid. You could smack it with your hand and it just would not wobble. It's, it's, it's a strong thing. But the gantry was not really uh, as good. It should have been more of a, a square shape. It's instead of like a, a tall sort of shape. It's it's 250 by 75 thick. It should have just been 250 by 250 uh, because the, the torsional rigidity is not great with that long Z axis as it sort of twists it. So that could have been better, but um, still it, it got the job done. And on top of that, the linear guides that I used were not really up to the task. They were the wrong type and they were too small too, but that was really just a budget constraint. Uh, I later changed the Z axis so it did have some nice box shaped uh, linear, gui linear guides, but that really just revealed that the gantry was the problem and not the Z axis. And the the rotary axes, that's what everyone wants to hear about, right? That's what I'm always being asked about by people. So that was using a 120 mil cross roller bearing on both axes. The both rotary axes are the same, identical. Um, they, they used an 80-20 sized harmonic drive and that was driven by a NEMA 23 stepper motor, but really I think that motor was oversized. It, it could have been about half, half the torque and it would have done the, the job just fine. The chassis was aluminium. All the, the chassis for the, the two rotary axes that they were machined manually on, on this machine behind me actually. And uh, that took about two months or so to do. It was pretty time consuming. I had to use, buy, I'd bought this machine just for the task. I had to buy a rotary table, I had to buy a vise. It cost me like $4,000 just to get the machinery to make this rotary head. And in the end, that, that rotary head was, it was actually really good. It was. 
I'd say better than the rest of the machine, but it did have some accuracy issues. Uh, that probably comes from the fact that I was using plastic vernier calipers to measure everything, like everything just about. I had a, a, an, an imperial micrometer for some smaller things, just one inch micrometer, but otherwise everything was done with a plastic vernier caliper. And I actually still have that rotary head. I took it off the machine before I sold it and it's actually sitting right here. That's gonna be going onto this machine as a trunnion, so I'm rotating it sideways and I'll, I'll change some things and fix the accuracy issues too. And that'll act like, act like a trunnion for this machine, so I'll have a five axis mill and that's gonna be, that's gonna be really good. The spindle that the rotary axes were holding or controlling, it was nothing special really, it's just a, you know, a Chinese 2.2 kilowatt, 24,000 RPM. Um, air-cooled VFD controlled kind of thing it's it's nothing special but uh, after after about a month or two of machining manually machining all the parts for the for the rotary axes I had to start thinking about how was I going to control everything what was the software I was going to use and I'd already used Mark 3 so Mark 4 seemed like a, an interesting option it was freshly on the market and um, and it looked way nicer than Mark III. Mark III looks awful. And uh, I didn't know that when I bought it that it doesn't have good functionality to actually handle multi-axis tilting tool kind of um, work. So I realized that I was gonna have to write something custom, make some sort of custom software to control the machine and to get the G-code that I wanted. So that custom solution came in the form of a Python script and that would do three major jobs. It would translate I, J, K tool vector values into B and C degrees angles for Mark IV to read. It would also calculate the linear offsets created to keep the tool on, on the point. And it would also convert some three axis G code into five axis G code, which was just an extra feature that I I figured out how to make. I didn't think I'd be able to do that, but yeah, I found a way and it was really cool. I'm quite proud of that one. The first thing that the script would have to do and what I thought would be the only thing at the time was that it would have to take some G code, which was exported from Fusion 360 using the generic Fennec post processor. And it would convert these IJK values that that post processor produced. And uh, the IJK values describe the orientation of the tool, whereas the XYZ describe the location of the tool. And so this directly drives the, the tool in, in location and orientation. If I is one, then J and K are zero, and they can all be anywhere between those, those values. And then XYZ would also continue to describe the location, the tip of the tool at all times. IJK describes the orientation and XYZ describes the location of the tool, which is super cool, but it's not actually useful for my machine. I needed something to be able to, I, I needed G code that had XYZ B and C in angle degrees to tell the machine exactly where to put it because Mark IV just can't read IJK values. It doesn't understand it. So I thought, mm, okay, I can do that. It's a little bit of trigonometry, but I can figure that out. So I started making it in Blender. I used that as a, like a verification process and uh, just writing a script inside Blender with Python. Pretty soon after that, I realized that as the rotary axes move, the tool tip offsets to a different position. So you need to then do some like trick, some extra trigonometry to figure out uh, how far it's been offset by and then move all the linear axes however necessary to get the tool back onto the intended position. And next up was the realization that the C axis can't spin forever. It's, it, it'll get the cables wrapped around it. So. The limitation on that was negative 360 degrees to positive 360 degrees. And um, so you need to figure out how to get it to unwind halfway through a program. So my solution was to get it to stop at its limitation at positive or negative 360 degrees, 
then it would always retract the tool along the axis of the, the current position, the current axis of the tool. Then it would rotate the B axis to zero degrees. Then it would unwind the C axis uh, 360 degrees away from the limit that it was currently on. So it would come back to its the same physical orientation, then rotate the B axis back to position and then go back to its original location, retract uh, or rather plunge along the tool axis and go back to what it was doing. The next unexpected problem that I had to deal with while writing, the, writing this script was that the feed rate would often be incorrect. It would either be faster or slower than intended. So if it's going around a convex shape, then um, the actual effective feed rate at the tip of the tool was not as programmed. And the solution to that I, I found out was actually to use inverse time feed rate, where instead of telling the machine how fast to move, you tell it how long it has to make that move. So from here to there, take this long, and you have to give a, a, an F value, a feed rate value for each movement. And uh, that will pretty much control the feed rate pretty well, as long as the machine can keep up with that. If it's going around a large convex shape and the machine just can't move that fast, then it'll just go as fast as it can. And the last problem that I came across when writing this script was that if the movement, the, the angular movement between two points, two you know, lines of G-code was too large, then the tool would still go off course. So the solution to that was to check the angle delta between those two points. And if the delta was greater than five, it would break up that movement into smaller sections and then you know, correct the path so it stayed on course at all times, or at least close enough. And so here's the really cool part about the script. So I, I needed to be able to convert some three axis G code into five axis G code. And so I wanted to use parallel tool paths, but Fusion 360 didn't have parallel tool uh, multi-axis parallel tool paths. So my solution was to use the three axis parallel, set the stock to leave to be the radius of a ball nose end mill uh, in, on the horizontal and vertical. So you've got this constant offset around the surface. And then inside the script, you can offset the tool down along the radius of the ball nose. And now you can pivot the tool from the center of that, that ball nose. Then you introduce what's called towards point tilting, where the tool will always face towards a point in space that you have defined. Now transform the toolpath to the new location and bam, you got a five axis parallel toolpath. And that's the Python script. So that took a few more months to make while also working on the electronics cabinet. And uh, that was a surprisingly um, complicated and proud accomplishment alongside having built the physical machine, writing the software for it was way more involved than, than I thought it was gonna be, but that was just as proud of an accomplishment as the machine. Following that, there was obviously a few more bits and bobs and, and troubleshooting and doing all sorts of other bullshit just to get the machine actually running in the end. And, and it did run, though it eventually ran into other problems, like I blew up one of the drivers for the steppers. So it had plenty of trouble while I owned it, but um, I, did, I did make a five axis CNC machine. So it's a really proud accomplishment. I, I'm super happy with it. I was ready to start machining molds to make the body shells at this point, but uh, <laughs> the depleting budget, uh, the depleting willpower and lack of knowledge just meant that I, I never actually figured out what material to make the molds out of. And uh, after trying a few things, maybe two or three months, no, nah, not three months, probably two months of, of uh, trying plaster, wood, heat resistant materials and all this stuff, I never figured out how to make a mold that could vacuum form polycarbonate that would not melt, melt, would not melt and would leave a nice shiny finish on the inside of the windows. You know, you want these windows to be nice and clear too. It was surprisingly hard to achieve. So I never really used the machine as it was intended. Um, it sat there for about six or seven years. I used it for some wood projects here and there like this racing simulator. Uh, which was also a really cool project. I made that over one weekend just before I started working a new job. 
And then uh, just in April this year, before I moved up to Brisbane, I sold it to a guy in Tasmania who makes nice high-end speakers. And uh, now I don't own the machine, but I do still have the rotary axes, as I, as I explained. And they'll be going on that machine behind me. So building this machine definitely taught me a lot of technical stuff and, and that continues to inspire the projects that I want to work on and sort of the, the way I approach a lot of my like machining and, and mechanical life actually. I also learned a lot from this project about just jumping into something even if you don't know how to solve or how to you know make it, how to solve the problem, you just jump in and as long as it's not impossibly hard for you, you'll figure it out as long as you feel invested in it. For me, that was thousands of dollars of investment. I remember the night that I actually spent, I clicked submit to spend $3,000 on electronics, still not really knowing how I was going to control the machine as far as the software side. I hadn't started the Python script yet, but um, I was excited. I was excited to build a five axis machine. I, I wanted to build a five axis machine. I didn't need to, but I wanted to, so I did it. And uh, it cost me a lot of money, it cost me a lot of time, but it was really fun. It taught me how to think about big challenges. And uh, the lessons from building the machine are really more valuable than anything I ever produced with the machine itself. So everything that I took from this machine, it will continue to It'll continue to inspire me while I build Max Super, and really, I think it'll continue to inspire me for the rest of my life.